us up a word of prayer and we'll get started. Father, we come before you tonight, Lord. We thank you for this day that you have made. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness and how you watch over and keep us. Lord, as we look at your study tonight, Lord, about effective witnessing, tell me others why we love you and why you love us. Tell me others, Lord, about the hope that is in us because of what you have done, Father, in sending your Son. Lord, we ask tonight, Lord, that you would just open our understanding, Lord, and then remind us, Lord, that it is about you, and you will guide us and direct us, Lord, and how to share this truth with others. And so, Lord, it's not about how skillful we are, Lord, it's about how faithful we'll be to you, that you might use us, Lord, for your kingdom work. So, Lord, I thank you tonight, Lord, I ask that you'd open up our understanding to uh, how to be effective witnesses, and to know, Lord, this is a call that you have placed upon each and every one of us that others might come to the saving knowledge of you. Lord, we ask that you remember those, Lord, that, we, that we're putting down on our concern list tonight. Lord, I want to just lift up Charlotte Cook to you as well, Lord, and that you would just uh, continue to be with her, Lord, and hold her and keep her, Lord, that uh, uh, she's struggling right now, Lord, with her breathing and everything, Lord, and a lot of anxiety, and we just ask that you would just give her comfort as only you can. We pray tonight, Lord, for... This is uh, Beatles, at the, at the Carol Beatles, Lord, that you just be with her, Carol Beatles, Lord, and that you just be with her. We met with her today, Lord, and just, uh, and then Adi's aunt, Olga, that you would be with her, Lord, uh, she's dealing with colon cancer, Lord. And so we come tonight, Lord, and just uh, bring these names, Lord, right now, and others will be put on the list, Lord, for those that we've met with this week, Lord, already, and that you just be with them. Lord, remind them and then touch them, Lord, and so we, you can. We just thank you for it. Now open our understanding to your word. Give us guidance and direction, Lord, that we might know, Lord, your word that is life for us. And that it will accomplish that that you've sent it out to do. And we thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When we started out on this, it just talked about tonight the qualifications of witnessing. And it just talked about there is qualifications of, of witnessing. One of the first things is, is that you got to be a believer. You have to have faith in Christ alone. You can't talk about something you don't know. You can't talk about and tell somebody they need it when you don't have it yourself. So it's about us coming to a saving knowledge and knowing that Christ is our, our Lord, our Savior, and King. We talked about how that the Scripture is the inspired Word of God as we've read before in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. That all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction, and righteousness. And that the man of God may be complete and equipped in every good work. It reminds us that as children of God, that not only do we know that we are a, a, a called to do this, but God will equip us to do the work. And that's the part that I love about it, that I don't have to do it in my own strength because I can't do it. But I can do it in his strength. That he can take the least of us, such as I and use us for his glory. And that's the great part of it. That's one says, what is the qualification? Why, who can God use? He uses all those who put their faith and trust in him. So when we're looking at the text tonight, we're going to continue to look at what qualifies a, a witness uh, as one who uh, knows the Lord, who puts their trust in the Lord. And it says, but uh, verse 15, of uh, number one, it says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and Always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And I just love that. And we need to be ready to tell what? Why we trust God. Why we believe in God. Why we put our hope and trust in Him. You have said, I have said, I don't know how anyone makes it in this world today without Jesus. It's just impossible. How a man struggles at himself trying to figure it out and how can he begin to think that he can accomplish anything apart from the Lord. So when we're looking at the Word tonight, let us be mindful of how important God's Word is to us. And so it's leading us, guiding us, and directing us that we might know how to walk with Him and walk in Him. So the Word that we looked at last week is save, save and know it. I know that I'm saved because God tells me so in his word, and God cannot lie. We look, talked about those scriptures, and we looked at those three, that what that God is not like man that he should lie, neither is the son of man that he should repent. He has he said, and shall he not do it? 
or has he spoken and shall not make it good. It just says that the word of God is what is life. And any time it goes out, it will, it will bring forth life because it comes from him. So God is not like man that he should lie. We can trust God's word that is an eternal word. Then we looked at the second one that said, you can be saved and know it. And that is the part that I continue to share with others. I had an opportunity uh, just yesterday talking to a lady. And it was great to know that she understood that her salvation was hinged on faith alone in Jesus Christ. She said, you know, I'm 96 years old and 94 years old. And she says, I put my trust in the Lord. I'm all right. I'm concerned about my family. I'm concerned about where, where will they be? Will they know him and walk with him? It says I raised them in church, but that doesn't mean anything because they're not running after the things of the Lord. And I'm concerned about their salvation. She says, but I know that I'm all right. I know who I put my trust in and my faith in. And I know who has brought me along the way. So I'm not afraid of dying. What I'm concerned about is leaving them, and they're not ready. They're not ready. They're not ready for the Lord to come, nor are they ready for me to leave. But I'm all right with it. And that is the part that we need to know, that sometimes when you know that you know that God's promise is an eternal promise, that even when that time comes for those that you love, begin to, to know that they're going to leave us and enter into his presence. There should be rejoicing. And again, that's what she was saying. I'm going to rejoice about it. And I pray my family would have a celebration of life knowing that I am with the Lord. And that is what I've hoped and put my faith and trust in. So the witness is the Holy Spirit that is in us. And it reminds us. And it says to us in Romans 8, 16, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For he did not receive the spirit of bondage again into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. And we talked about that. That means like daddy, daddy. There's a close relationship and that he desires to have with us. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. And if heirs of God, then joint heirs with Christ. And indeed, we suffer with him that we may also be glorified together. So it lets us know that we suffer in the salvation that was given to Christ through his death. And the word of God tells us that we should what, pick up our cross and follow him. That lets us know that it's not just about the heaviness of the cross. It's about the fact that we must die to self that God may be glorified in us. So what scripture tells us is no longer I that lives, but it is Christ that lives within me. It's reminding us that that is what our desire is. We want Christ to be identified or want our lives to be identified with Christ Jesus. That someone wouldn't have to wonder if you're a child of God. They can tell by your action how you respond or just how the fact how you choose to live with faith and trust and hope and him and him alone. So when it talks about that, that the witness of, of, of God must have faith in him and faith alone. That's what we have. It is faith in him. We trust him to be God in every circumstance, situation of our life, that we have faith in him to lead us, guide us, and direct us in all truth. Then it tells us also that the witness is the word of God, and that word is life to us. And these things I have written in verse 13 written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So it's not about faith for a moment. It's about faith for eternity. It is about I trust God no matter what I find myself going through and going and find myself having to deal with. So then I can know that I'm saved and I can know it. I know that the Word of God reminds me and it witnesses to me that who I am in Christ. And then it goes on to tell us that that separated, that we are set apart for the things of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he uses us, and that we're set apart for him. We are here, each and every one of us, is set apart to what? To be a light in the midst of darkness, to be that salt in the midst of a sinful world. And what that means is just that God is preparing us, equipping us, and, and he hung to allow us to have an eternal an eternal. Uh, glory in him and with that eternal glory is that we are able to be salt and it's salt that remains and it's salt that is salty it's not that that has lost its flavor that we will be the seasoning for those that are lost say i don't know about you but i like food with seasoning on it you know i, I know that people go, well i don't want to put this on this and that i don't want food if it don't have seasoning bring me that salt and pepper and whatever else you got in that cabinet now i don't need it necessarily to be hot but i want to have taste to it 
I want to be able to taste it, and, and I want to be able to enjoy it. And so that's what we should be. We should have a flavor of God that when people begin to experience their life with us, with Christ in us, that it will be a flavor that they can begin to say, I want that. Have you ever tasted something and, and ate it and then wish there was more of it left? You know that last piece that would have been in the tray or in the pan and everybody else got theirs and you got your last little bit and then there's nothing else to get? <laughs> That's, that's what God is like. It's like I, you taste it and you know it's good and you just want more of it. Now, maybe I'm the only one that's like that. No. I like to have a little bit set back for me a little later. I never let Anita bring anything to the church over these years without leaving a little bit at home because I know that everybody's going to eat what she brings and that pan will be empty. So I'm going to make sure when I get home, I will still have something left for me. We ought to be a flavoring that God would cause others to want to yearn after the things of God, desire the things of God, want the things of God. And so he has set us apart for the gospel. And Paul talks about that in Romans 1, as we were looking at that, it talked about in those verses that he was a, called himself a bond servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle separated for the gospel of God, which he promised before, before through his apostles and the Holy Scripture. So what it tells us that eternal life and promises of God were given to us long before Christ came on the earth. That it tells us that before his birth, that, and then when God became man, before his birth, it already talked about that the Savior was going to come, one who was going to save man, that we might be, have a right relationship with God. So it lets us know that we are called, and God desired us to walk with him, to know him. And so he says he promised before through his prophets and the Holy Scripture concerning his son Jesus our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to, his, to the flesh and, de and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. It lets us know that without the resurrection of the dead, then where is our hope if all he did was die for our sin and then that stayed in the ground? But because he rose from the ground, it lets us know that we will have life as well with him. So the child of God's life is not from this day he's born until that time that it says that he has went into the presence of God. And everyone talks about that dash in the middle. And that represents him. But God has something else for us. That at the end of this life here, there's an eternal life that he promises. And that dash will never have an end. Our birth right here has a beginning and an end. But that that we have in Christ is the eternal life that we will have eternally with him. And so there will never be an end to the dash. You're born in Christ. And when you're born in Christ, it just continues on and on and on. And that is what the believer's hope is about. That we will be with him one day and we will walk with him. So we've been set apart for the things of God and the promises of God. We read earlier that his word will not come back to him void. It will be it will complete what he has sent it out to do. His word is life for us. And then it talked about how that in the scriptures that Paul was writing in Romans, um, verse 8 talks about that his desire to be a witness to others. It says uh, In verse 5 it says, through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ. So he's letting us know that he says, I'm an apostle. We said, well, I'm not an apostle, but we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. And he has called us for a purpose of sharing this hope with other people, that other people might see his life in us and then desire it, would want it. The, the flavoring of God, the aroma of God's glory being coming off of us as they watch us put our faith and our trust in him and him alone among whom you also are called. Then it says, To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, because to you, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Here it talks about in seven, and we need to get this. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. We talk about St. Matthew, St. John, St. Peter, St. this, but you know, we're saints of God. Now you may say, I don't feel like a saint, but you, it, it isn't about how you feel, it's about what God has given you. He has set you apart for Christ Jesus. Sometimes we hear the phrase, and it goes like this, that I, 
I'm a sinner saved by grace. It tells us where we came from, but it lets us know where we're at. But you know, we're not, and when someone says when, that we're wrong when we say that I'm not a sinner, well, I understand I'm not a sinner. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. It says the old things passed away, and behold, I become new in Him. Now, in new in Him means that I'm continuously becoming new and newer in Him, better and better, or gooder and gooder, as I used to hear Him say. So we need to know that we will grow in our relationship with the Lord. But it says old things pass away. As we begin to mature in the things of the Lord, there may have been things that we used to do, but we don't do it anymore because while we are in Christ, Jesus, that we are sons and the daughter of the Most High God, that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, uh, through Christ Jesus, and then as children of God, that we have been called to this place, and we are called saints of His. So, it doesn't mean that we walk around thinking that we're more than that, but it lets us know that we have come to know Him as our Savior. And you need to be recognized. And I guess if you understood your position in Christ Jesus, you would begin to want to operate out of that position. When I think about sports and I think about the position that people are in that uh, in, in the sports, they know the position that they're playing. They're not trying to play the position of somebody else. They're trying to play their position. As children of God, we are saints of God. We're called to play in, in the righteousness and the holiness of God. And that's where we live. That's where we operate. And that's what we strive to do. And even if we come short of that glory, we get back up. And we run after again. So that would be the same thing as an athlete. If you miss the play, you don't throw your glove down or you just take your uniform off and say, I'm done because why? I didn't do it right. But everybody, have you seen them? Even Michael Jordan missed a shot. Larry Bird missed a shot. And Joyce was a, a great golfer. And every time, and she didn't get everything the way that she wanted. Every now and then, instead of par, she went a little bit over. And so what we find is that in Christ Jesus, what we're striving, she didn't throw the clubs away and say, well, I didn't play good today, so I'll never play again. No, she went back out there because why, whatever she missed on that other, when she came to that hole again, she said, I'm going to play it different this time. I know what it's about. I know how it runs. I know how it's done. And so when we're doing that, that's what it says, that we are the saints of God, not because we are perfect, but we're striving after the righteousness and the perfectness that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So someone says that you're a saint, it lets us know that that's our position, that's the place that we're in, and in that position, that's how we ought to operate, that's how we ought to live in the righteousness that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So it tells us then that after that, that not only were they called to called to be saints, but that we are obedient to the things of God. And so to all of those in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to say, first I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. I like the fact that Paul is letting us know that when we are saved and born again, it's important that what? We pray one for another. He says, I'm praying for the people that are in Rome. The children of God are there. He says, and first I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you that your faith is spoken of throughout the world. That tells us that he's thanking, he's praying about us, he's praying for us. And we ought to be praying one for another. There's an importance why we put that the prayers down. And I know that I've said to you that I need to probably copy down the prayers of prayer requests of this week and then hand them out to you the next week so that you would know what we need to be praying about. That you yourself begin to say, I want that prayer list or I'm taking my uh, program home or whatever it's called on Sunday morning that we hand out bulletin and you're looking at them that are on a prayer concern list and we're saying I'm praying for those. We need to take that time to pray one for another that God's best would be upon the lives of each and every one who is in the body of Christ. And it's important that we pray for the church body. Pray one for another. Everybody in here is going through something you may not know that they're going through because why? We know how, as I said last week, we know how to put on the mask. We know how to, to look good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And we're just struggling like big time at, in, in our regular living. But when we just begin to say, I'm praying for you. That lets us know that we're not in this race. We're not dealing with these things of the Lord by ourselves. That we're not just 
living through and thinking that we have to drag ourselves through the mire, the, uh, the muck of life, but we have those that are praying for us and they're opening up a way that we may get up on the foundation that is in Christ Jesus. So it's important that we take those names and we begin to pray one for another, look to one another. It's all right to say to someone, I'm going to be praying for you, but I found out that if I say that and I don't pray that instant, I'm going to probably forget. So I've learned to say, I'm, let, let's pray right now. And that has been out in the middle of the street or there at Kroger's or, or High B or any place else that where we might be, that we pray. It doesn't have to be a long prayer. It just has to be a prayer dealing with the circumstance, situation that they're in. It ain't for everybody to hear. It's just for them to hear. But it says that we ought to pray one for another. Paul says, I'm praying for you. I'm wanting you to know that, I, uh, that I, I've seen what God is doing and doing in you. Let us be encouragers to one another. When you see people striving at the things of the Lord, somebody hasn't been in church in several weeks. Now they've been in church for the last two or three weeks in a row. Let us go to them and say, man, it's good to see you again. I'm glad to see you coming back. You've been in our prayer. Somebody would think, somebody's been praying for me. That's why I got back here. Because somebody has lifted me up before the Lord that I might come to my senses and get back on track. Because we, I've heard it said so many times, well, you know how it is, Pastor. You miss one, and then you miss the second one, and the third one, and then it just becomes easier to just stay home. You want to go, but I want to send you out of going. Well, you know, the same thing is let's then get work, work our way back into the practice of going. That when we're not there, we feel out of sorts, out of place. And that is even, even when we're on vacation. Let us find a church where we can worship at and, and praise the Lord. And when we're on vacation, we say, well, it's Sunday. I'm on vacation. I need to lay back. And God is saying, you're on vacation because I've blessed you. Why don't you just sit and spend an hour with me? And I was talking with some people the other day and just talking about how many people just say, you know, come the weekend. The weekend is mine. Mine. <laughs> and I'm not talking about the loss. I'm talking about them that are saved. I've been working a lot and I'm at this and, and by Sunday I am just tired and that's why I haven't made it to church. Well, who gave you the strength to go for those seven days working all that overtime, making all that money? Who's been blessing you? Surely he ought to be good for an hour and at 15, 20, maybe an hour and a half or a little longer, depending on uh, how many songs we sing. Not oh, the yeah. preaching. And so um, we good. want to look at those things and we want to begin to say, why are we not giving God our best? We want to give Him our best every time. So Paul is saying, I'm praying for you. I'm mentioning you always uh, in my prayers. Make your request that is sought uh, by some uh, means. Now, at last, I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. His desire was to be with them in fellowship. Somebody says some, every now and then, why, why is it that you, uh, why is it that we always have to come together? The fellowship of the body of believers. I've never found the world ever tell me they're praying for me. I've never found anyone saying, you know, I've been thinking about you. You've been on my heart. I, I, I've been asking God for you. I never found that on one bar show that anyone ever said that to me. <laughs> Not out there in the playground and all of those things there. I found that the world was concerned about the things of the world, but nobody was concerned about my salvation or where my life is going and how I'm going. They just got busy in the things of, of the world. Now, if I was John Grant, I was wearing a cardinal shirt and stuff, they might have came and talked to me and said, to me, you know, that's my team too, or they would have booed me, you know, that they're for the Cubs. And so then, uh, but even in that, then we have something in common. We love baseball. Let us be that that has in common with others, and let somebody know that we are what? We're children of the Most High God, that God has called us. And when people say to you, you think you all that, but says the Word of God says I'm the same. Now, I know that I'm not. But God has said, because of what Jesus has done and my faith in Him, that I have arrived to sainthood. And that means that I have to begin to want to run in it. So I'm not trying to be something that I'm not. That's who I am. That's who we are. We are children of the Most High God. And so my family used to say, you're a Bailey. Act like that. Now, I understood what they meant. But I also knew there were some babies that you didn't want to act like that. <laughs> you know? And so when somebody said to you, are you a Bailey? Every now and then you had to say, why? Because you didn't know it. Your cousins had done something and they just wanted to hit a Bailey. You might have been the one they would have nailed. And so we want to know that we are children of God and we want everyone to know that Christ lives in us.
and that is our desire. We may come up short, but what we're going to do, we're going to get back up and begin to run after the things of the Lord. So in verse 11, he says, For I long to see you, and that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established. Paul is concerned about men and women growing. My question is, are we concerned about people growing in their faith? Are we concerned about people knowing and walking in a right relationship with God? Paul says, I long to see you. And so when I said that person who had been there for, for several weeks now is back, you would say to them, I long to see you and that you might grow it. And I'm glad to see you back in Sunday school. I'm glad to see you back at the Bible study. I'm glad to see you. Or maybe we're saying to you, you know, you've been coming. Are you in Bible study? Are you in Sunday school? I remember sharing with a couple not too long ago that we have this and that. If you want to, want to grow and, and know the body of Christ, then you need to be in Sunday school. You need to be in Bible study. And lo and behold, there they were in Sunday school and Bible study because why? They're saying, I want more of Jesus. And if you want more, then you begin to desire that and begin to walk in. It doesn't mean that you know. It means that I don't know, but I want to know him better. I want to grow in him. I want to be established. And so it says that, Paul says that that you may be established. And that's what God wants us to be established. You see, every business that's ever made that it goes up and they have that out there that EST where they're established. And it gives out the year. We've been established from the day of your salvation. That was when you were established to be a child of God. And we should grow in that relationship with Him. And that is that I may be encouraged together be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Paul is saying the importance of you and I coming together in Christ Jesus. That means the body of Christ, what? We need each other. We have to have each other in our lives if we're going to grow. When Christians tell me I don't need anybody, I just get in my word and I have time with the Lord, they're walking on dangerous uh, turf because why? Um, when you're not bouncing the word off of one another, encouraging one another, you get out there, the devil begins to tell you what this scripture means this and that it means that. And all of a sudden you're thinking that the, the saints of old didn't know what they're talking about because you got a new vision. The Lord revealed that to me. I've heard that said to me many times. The Lord revealed that to me. And I say to them, I can't find that in the scripture. I can't find that in the word of God. Well, you know, God is showing that in this day, this is how it is. We stand on the word of God. And that's what he was telling them. I want you to be established in the word. I want you to be established in Christ Jesus. That you might, what? That I might encourage you to know that you can do this in the Lord. The word tells us what I can do all things through Christ who is my strength. But if Christ is my strength and I can do all things through him, then surely I would be able to do better than I've been. But sometimes I don't know how to do better. Have you ever been in a place in your life that you knew there's something you needed to do, you just didn't know how to get it done. Mm -hmm. I've been there. I've been there. I know there's more, but I don't know how to get there to make that happen. And that's what the body of Christ is. We come alongside each other and say, I know what you're struggling with. I've been there. But if we do this, begin to find these principles to our life, you're going to find out that you can. So the child of God is not trying to walk this life in their own strength. They're learning how to trust in God's word and begin to apply what the principles of God to our life. And when we begin to do that, we begin to see that the word of God works and that what he's doing in us is him doing it and not ourselves. And so we then, we then have the confidence to say to everybody else, the same God that is working in you will work in them. Or the same God working in me will work in you. Because why? That's what it's all about. It's about us growing in the truth of who Jesus is and the Word of God. And when we apply those principles of God to our life, the principles of God work. They work. And that's what we were looking at earlier. Yeah, His Word always works. Now that I... Now, I do not want to be, I don't want you to be unaware, brother, that I often plan to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as, just as among the other Gentiles. I like that fact is that Paul says that his life, his purpose, his, his, his place in this life as a child of God is to bring forth what? More fruit among the brethren of Christ Jesus. See, don't you want to be fruitful? Do you not want to see us grow in our, our walk with the Lord? And that's what it's talking about, that we should desire to see people begin to be fruitful in the things of the Lord. So we begin to 
hole around them. We begin to pour the fertilizer, the, the water there to get them ready so they can begin to grow. We want to encourage them because why? We want to see them bring forth fruit that will remain. That their lives are being transformed and beginning to grow in the things of the Lord. When they begin to grow in the word of the things of the Lord and the word of the Lord, that you find then that there's fruit then that is in their life. There's that joy, that peace, that comfort of knowing. So he says that I wanted to get there because why? I want to see you bring forth much fruit that is that is yours to have. And then he says, just as I have done with the other Gentiles, I want to do it with others. Paul is saying that a child of God's life ought to be one that is fruitful, that is, that we're there encouraging, building up others, that people can walk in the things of the Lord. I've had the opportunity, and you probably have too, that you've been somewhere at, with someone. In fact, I remember not before she had passed, that Phyllis Vandermeer, um, had gotten a letter from someone who said, I thank God for you because you impacted my life at a time when I needed you. That means there was fruit being done. There was being fruit coming out of that person's life and it said, because you were there for me when I needed it. What he was also saying was that I didn't even know I needed it. See, sometimes when you're in the body of Christ, you're not sure exactly what you need, but others begin to say, if you'll do it this way, the Word of God says if you do it this way, that you will gain much fruit. So we need to be encouragers with other people, letting them know that they can grow in the things of the Lord. But it is what? It's a walk by faith. It just doesn't happen. So just like the fruit growing on the tree, it doesn't happen. There's a season. There's a time you got to have. The farmer who plants the, the corn and stuff in the fields and trying to get out there to get that done. It doesn't come up overnight. And they don't go back and they dig it up to see if anything's happening after they plant it. No, they continue on and they trust is it to do what it is called to do. Bring forth many ears and many kernels on that corn. And so Christ is saying that we as children of God need to plant that word, nurture that word and others that they might what? Begin to bring forth fruit in the things of the Lord. It may not come right away, but it will come. It will come. Some things you have won in your Christian life that you have overcome. You prayed about something and instantly it happened. But there's other things that you've had to work at. And other things, because Paul talked about what a thorn in his side. They said, I prayed about this three times. And, and, and finally the Lord said to him, don't bring this to me anymore. He said, why? Because my grace is sufficient. What he was saying to him, I'm not going to let you have victory in everything. You'll get victory, but you're going to get it one step at a time. So then the question comes down to, Lord, why don't you just take care of all of this right now? And he says, if God took care of it right now, then all of a sudden you would think that you got everything you need. And we need to be reminded, we can't make it without the Lord. And there's some things in our life that we are free of now. But there's other things that we're only free because why we continue to pursue after the things of the Lord. You will still have victory. I was watching a, a documentary last night on, on Muhammad Ali and uh, and... He talked about what he was going to do to George Foreman in, uh, in, in that boxing match. And he said, uh, I, I know what he does. He knocks out everybody in two rounds. He said, uh, no, I don't hit hard. He says, I hit people a lot, but I don't hit hard. He said, I may have to go the distance with him and stuff, but he's not used to going the distance. I just need to get in there and just hold my own until uh, I... Until I'm able to get him. And we know what he did. He did what it was called the rope dope. He just kind of laid back. He let George just hit him and hit him and hit him and hit him. And finally he just wore out. And then he took him out. He didn't take him right away. It wasn't no first round. It wasn't none of those things there. It was in the distance. But when he got him, he got him. There's things that God is saying. It ain't going to happen. You're in this battle. You're in this war. But if you prepare yourself, you will find yourself victorious. Now, he had to take some blows. There's some things that will come at us. There's some things that the enemy will bring our way. There'll be some frustrations along the way. But we shall overcome in the things of the Lord. And that's what our faith is based on. And that's what he was trying to share with the body of Christ. To let them know they're going to go, go through some things. But I'm going to encourage you that we may go through this thing not by ourselves. But we'll go through it. You and me, the both of us together in the things of the Lord. Then in verse 13 it says, Now... I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered. You talked about that. 
that I may have some fruit among you, that I, just as among the Gentiles, I am a debtor both to the Greek and to the barbarian, both to the wise and the unwise, so as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Paul was telling us, and we looked at it earlier, that it said, always be ready to tell someone about this life that you have in Christ Jesus. And there he is saying again, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. He says, it doesn't matter who it is. I have it welled up inside of me. It is in me and it's ready to come out and tell somebody that what, how good God is. And that's what it's all about. It's not telling somebody how bad they are and that they need a Savior. It's about telling somebody how good God is and that's why they should want Him to be their Savior. That they need to know that in this life you're going to have some this and that. And some may think that they can do it on their own. But I said to you, and I've been saying it now for a while, how does that work for you? How is it when you're in charge and you're leading the charge on your own? Most people find themselves wore out, beat up, broke down, trying to get themselves in a good place. I'm trying to get my life in order. Well, if you could get your life in order, then you would not need Jesus. Jesus came because man cannot ever get his life in order. He can never get himself in a, in a right place. He needs the power and the Spirit of God to do that in him. So then he goes on to say to us in verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God, uh, to salvation for everyone who believes. So then it tells me then what? For everyone who believes in the Lord has that opportunity to come to salvation in Christ Jesus. So he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. He, what he said earlier, that I'm ready to preach this gospel to you who are in Rome, in Rome because why? I am not ashamed to tell someone that Jesus Christ, God came, born of a virgin, walked this earth 33 years with signs and wonders. He took the sin of the world upon himself. He was beaten beyond recognition. And then he was nailed on the cross. And he died for the sins of the world. That the Jesus was the Lamb of God. That the sin was placed upon. And that our sins are removed because of Jesus Christ. It says he was buried according to scripture. And he rose on the third day. And because of that, man can have a life through Jesus Christ because he was God's propitiation, the sacrifice that Father received to himself and said, his finished work is enough to save anyone who puts their faith in him. So it doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter how bad your past has been or where you were raised or how you were raised. Jesus Christ came that none should perish, all should have everlasting life. So he says what? I will preach this gospel everywhere I go to tell anyone and everyone about Jesus. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jews first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the, written, the just shall what live by faith. So it's been what? It's been revealed from faith to faith. So it's just saying that my faith in Christ allows you to have faith in Christ. And so from faith to faith, so we grow in our faith in Christ Jesus. And all of that is about what? It's about trusting God. Trusting God. So as we talked about the thing for this year, faith to trust God. Is about us coming to that place of understanding that we, He wants us to know Him. Step out in areas of our life that we have never uh, thought about doing before because why we have faith to trust in Him. So when He writes this and tells us all about these things, then He says, well, I don't have to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God to salvation for everyone. Who believes and so it doesn't matter who that person is they have an opportunity to hear and receive the good news of jesus christ but as we've been talking about how can they hear unless there's what one that will go he's talking about us he's talking about us going out so then it tells us also that first that here in a that a holy desire to share the spiritual gifts verse 11 for I long to see you, that I may impart to you some, sp some spiritual gifts, so that you may be established. So what we're talking about, the just live by faith. It's talking about that it's by faith. It's about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that a holy desire to share the spiritual gifts of God. That should be in us. Then it talks about also the holy purpose 
uh, to bear fruit, that desire to see people grow in the things of the Lord. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. As I was reading at this time, I thought about parents. I thought about people raised in the church. I was thinking about Donnie's aunt that said, you know, I'm concerned about my children. I'm not afraid of dying. I know what my reward is, but I'm, I'm concerned about where they're at in their walk. And then she went on to tell me, said, you know, that the word of God says that we'll be known as we are known. That means that we'll know each other. I said, that's right. I said, most people don't even get it when that scripture is being read, that we will know each other, that those that we prayed with and those that have prayed for us, those that have shared with us, one day we will be in the glory of God. Now that husband and wife thing won't connect because why all of us will be the bride of Christ. We will be married to him. But what it does say is that we will know the relationship we have with one another. I believe that sons and daughters will know their mother and father, will know grandma and grandpa, will we'll have that right relationship. But it talks about that not only shall we desire the spiritual gifts of the things of God that to share, but it says that there'll be the fruit. But it says what? That he had planned that and desired to, to be there. But it says, and but was hindered that I may have some fruit among you. And in that part there, I believe that sometimes we don't understand all that we can have in Christ Jesus. I do not want you to be aware, brother, that I often plan to come to you, but I've been hindered until now. There may be that right opportunity now to share with that person you've been working with, to share with that son and daughter who has been closed-minded to the things of the Lord, but they're going through some things now. Maybe this is the opportunity to share this hope with them, to let them know of God's love and what God is able to do. It allows us to begin to pray about those circumstances, situations. It's about us beginning to mend broken relationships that God may be glorified in our life. And so he has said, there's been some things that hindered us from sharing this hope, but I'm, I'm coming now. And so those things that, that we may not have felt comfortable about sharing it with others, and we're saying now, I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming what? To share this hope with you. Because I don't want to stand before the Lord and say, I had it in me, but I wouldn't give it to anybody. I knew what I should have said. I should have said what was brought to me. What? John 3, 16 and 17. That he did not, 17, that he did not come to condemn the world, that through him the world might be saved. And so when we're looking at the text, when we're looking at the scripture, there may be some things that hindered us in the past. But the word of God says, but now the right time is here. That we need to begin to share that hope. So they've been plugged here. They didn't want to hear it before. But you know, I know that stuff comes in people's lives. And all of a sudden that they're ready to hear because what? They're just tired of being tired. Some of you already know that. You remember that. You just got tired of being tired. You wanted something different for your life. You just couldn't continue to go on that way. So we may be hindered for a while. But in due time, we'll be ready to share this hope. And they will be ready to hear it. Then C says, a holy obligation to pay the spiritual debt. Verse 14 of, of Romans. I am a debtor both to the Greek and to the barbarian, both to the wise and the unwise. The holy obligation to pay a spiritual debt. That, that Jesus came and wanted to pay the debt for all of our sin. But this message is that, that he said, I'm a debtor to everyone. That my desire is that to give this hope to everyone. It doesn't matter where they come from, wise, unwise. Um, the Greek or the barbarians, the, barbarians, uh, the bar barbarian, uh, that, um, that they all will come to the same knowledge of Christ. It said earlier, and not only to the Romans, but to the Gentiles as well. So we know that, not to, no, excuse me, Romans, not to the Jewish people, but also to the Gentiles as well. So he wants everyone to know that Christ came for everyone. Opportunities that I've had to share with people from India, Africa, and different places of the world working at Caterpillar. And we talk about the things of the Lord. And I would share with them my Jesus. I let them share about them. Tell me about their religion. Tell me about those things there. And I've heard in several of those cases that, you know, we desire the same things. And we're trying to do the same thing. I said, but there's a difference. Because I'm doing it in the things of the Lord, Jesus Christ, and you're not. And they look at me about, why would you say such a thing as that? Because I believe what I have is just as good as what you got. 
But the Word of God said there's no way to the Father except to the Son. If you don't know Jesus Christ, your good works will never get you where you need to be. You must be what? Born again. And if a child of God doesn't believe that, then maybe he needs to check his own salvation to make sure that they are saved. So when it's saying that to us, we share it, what? In love. It's not about beating anyone down with it. It's about loving them. I'm sharing this with you because why? I love you and I want you to come to the saving knowledge that is in Christ Jesus. Then it said, D, the holy eagerness to share the gospel. Eagerness to share. A lot of times people you say, hey, you want to share this? Let's go out and witness. Have you had anybody ever say that to you? This Saturday we're going to meet, we're going to go and knock on some doors and share Christ and those things there. How about you coming with me? And I'm telling you, I've heard all the excuses possible about why they couldn't make it today. And it's hard when it's 80 and 90 degrees out there. I think it's going to snow Saturday. But, you know, um, people just don't want to do it. They don't want to do it because why? They think that they have to be this or that. What it says is that we just have to know how we got saved. By the good news of Jesus Christ. And it's always going to be what? The good news of Jesus Christ. The preaching of the gospel. So it tells us that what? There ought to be an eagerness in us to share this hope. We're looking for an opportunity to share Christ with other people. Verse 15 says, So as much as it is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Or to share with that person that I've been writing back and forth to work with. Or that person I've been working alongside of. That person that I've gotten a chance and opportunity to know uh, outside of Caterpillar. Outside of uh, church. Outside of, of my normal uh, connections with other people. Jesus Outreach has given me opportunity to share hope with many who have come in our doors for drug and alcohol treatment. But to tell them about our Jesus. And I let them know, I says, now every now and then you will hear scriptures. And you know that we pray before we start and after we end. And you did come to a place called United in Jesus Outreach. So you should have thought something might come up. <laughs> but what I found a lot of times on one-on-one, -on -one, after some have said, I talked to you afterwards. They're going through some things in, in, in their life. And I've had the opportunity since I've been here to say to them, I'm the pastor of the First Baptist Church, and we have this going on, and this going on, and this going on. You know, and we got men's groups, and we got women's groups, we got those things there. And though some of them have come and they did not stay, they came and they were able to drink of your goodness and your willingness to share with them, to be there for them. And I find that even after they have walked away and, and when things get tough, they still call back here and say, uh, I just need a prayer. Could you put me on the prayer list? Can you do those things there? I said to us earlier that things may not come as rapid. There's things that hinder. There's things that come. The things that hinders many times is not because you're not bold enough. It's hindered. It hinders it because why? They're hard-headed. Now, maybe none of you were ever hard-headed when it comes to the things of the Lord. I've been very slow. I've been slow as far as what? A to Z, A1 to Z, 627, A to Z. That many times of being slow, still wanting to do it my way. Dennis, I know you've never wanted to do it your way. <laughs> now watch out now. Now watch out what you say now, because you may, you may like be like a Pinocchio. Yeah. Well, I, I did pretty good. Yeah, I, I've never done any of those things. Yeah. Well, but, so what we find is that we all find ourselves struggling at times when somebody's just waiting to hear this good news again. I've heard it before. I, I, I used to go to church when I was little. But now I'm in this predicament of life and I'm not sure what I need to do. And we need to be bold enough to say, you just need Jesus. What does that mean? We begin to share this hope. And then we let them know that we will walk with you. It may not happen. I may have to have coffee with you six, seven weeks in a row, meeting together and just us talking. But we'd be willing to do those things that others may come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. It isn't necessarily that we're going to see 3,000 come because of the preaching of the word at that particular moment. But the truth of it is, many of them that came that night when it was preached there in Acts, that they had heard about, they had seen, they had been about it. And now they have made a conviction in their heart to say, I want him. That's my Lord and Savior. I want him. 
uh, to know him and to walk into the light of him. So it wasn't that they hadn't heard about the miracles and hadn't heard about what Jesus did or the teachings that he had done. They had not made a decision. But when they heard that truth of the good news then, their hearts were convicted by the Holy Spirit and they came to know Christ as their personal Savior. So it tells us that there ought to be an eagerness in us and then a boldness in us because why we're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it's the power of God and the salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and then for the Greek. So in that scripture that's letting us know that God has plans for us and that he, he wants us to walk with him. He wants us to, to, to know him, to, to, to operate in the goodness of his love. And so when we have that, the word here tells us, I can't be ashamed because why? If it was not for the Lord on my side, where would I be? The note says to us to be separated unto the gospel is to share the good news with the lost. And, and so we're talking about what the outline of uh, the teaching that was in the abundant life and so it operates here so it says separate to be separated unto the gospel is to share the good news with the lost the abundant life that comes in Christ Jesus and that's what we're going to look at now the abundant life is a separated life and that's what we've been talking about we talked about it there in Romans 1 1 for Paul it was a bond servant we talked about that in the scriptures we saw those things there it talked about his faithfulness and as and, and God's uh, and his willingness said to go there. That he was a bond servant of Jesus Christ called to be apostle, separated to the gospel which he had promised. And so the word of God is what is the promise of God? It's a promise of his love and his faithfulness. It's a word that had been given to let people know that God had a plan. It talks about Jesus fulfilled the prophecies of the Lord and that he come to that that he filled those things in his flesh and that he came and, and lived for us. And then it goes on in verse 4, it says, And declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. It goes on to tell us that, and that, as the scriptures that we've already went over again, and so we're not going to look at all, everything that was said, but it also talks about what separated is both positive and negative. So when we have a separation in the things of the Lord, it says you are to be what set apart for the gospel of God. And this is a positive in Romans 1.1. 1, 1. But then it goes on to tell us that you are to come out from anything that is contrary to the perfect will of God that is negative. So it tells us that there's a positive and a negative that we need to separate our things from. We separate us from the things of darkness that we walked in into the light of the things of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 6, 17, and we're going to look at uh, those, those verses here, starting at verse 11, that we, we are called to be holy. O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our hearts is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own afflict, affections. Not in return for the same. I speak also to children. You also be open. He's telling that everyone there needs to know that our flesh hinders us from operating in the things of the God, the things of God. So he tells them, the old Corinthians, that he tells that we've spoken openly. We share the word with you. We have lived the word with you. Uh, we have done all of these things, and you've heard the truth of it. And I, but you are not restricted by us, but you're restricted by what? Your own affections. People of the world, they love darkness rather than they love light. That's what we live in. People love sin. People love sin. Now, I tell you what, you can, you can have a great movie come out or a great show, and you can talk about the Bible, you can have it on for a period of time. You try to put it on every night of the week, 365 days of the year, you would drop off quickly. They may talk about everybody viewed it and saw this here, but after a while, they will not... They would, they would drop their hands and say, that's enough of that. But, oh, you have a TV show like The Thrones. It, I hear that people rave and talk about it. I have a brother-in-law who loves it. He sat down and tried to tell me about this show. I said, I ain't got time. I ain't got time. I saw what he was watching, and, and, and I said, he said, this person is this, and that's that, and they did this here. Brother, I don't care. I do not have time for this. So it, it may have excited him, 
but then the side of me. It wasn't about the things of the Lord. Oh, I'm sure it's a good show and those things there. But you know, it's like a soap opera. You miss it for uh, uh, three or four months in a row, and you may have to get caught up. Well, maybe not a soap opera because it went on and on for weeks at a time, and you could go back. With my mama used to go back a little later, and she was still pretty well close. The only difference was was that there was a boy that was my age when it started, and then when I was only a few years older, he was now 15. And so we were children at the same time. They grow fast on TV. Um, but it tells us that here as believers in Christ, that there's a positive and a negative thing when it comes to the things of the Lord. Everything about God is positive, And the things of the world are negative. And what they do, they restrict us from coming into the right relationship that God has called us to be in. It went on to say, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, talking about in marriage. For what fellowship has the righteous with the lawlessness? And it says, and what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Baal uh, or Satan? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. He's saying to them that were believing in different religion, he says, what relationship do we have with them that are lost? When God had called the children of Israel, he told them not to marry outside of their own. Don't get caught up in those other things. And we found out when they did those things, they found themselves being drugged down because why they put their hope in something that was never alive. The Word of God tells us that none of those idols ever was able to do anything. In fact, the glory of God was able to knock their idols over, and, 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 and God was, uh, was glorified in the midst. It tells us that people will seek after something that they can control. But when you come after the things of God, you can't control it. It controls you. It allows you to be able to be transformed. It allows you to be able to have new life. You do not come a believer and say, God, this is how it's going to be done. No, you come a believer in Christ. God says, if you want to have life, this is how it is. And he doesn't change any of those things there. So he tells us that there are things that we need to know as believers of Christ. There's some positive and there's some negative things that we'll be dealing with in this life. And so, so many times... We've seen people who marry outside of those who are not believers, and we find there's a struggle. And then after a while, and especially when that young lady's married and stuff, she's dragging the kids off the church, but he won't go. He will not be part of it. He will not be part of the things that God has called us to. But she married him. And her hope is that one day he would come to the saving knowledge, but his mind thought his eye things restrict him from being what God would have him to be. And that's what he's talking about in that scripture. That we should guard ourselves, that we should not marry those that don't want the things of God. But it doesn't mean then that people can't come to the Lord because there's unsaved folks who got married and then one got saved. I remember a couple, she got saved later on in the marriage. The children were already uh, uh, in uh, young age at uh, 10 and 11 and so she comes to know the Lord as a personal savior. Husband got upset because she spent so much time at church and, and running after the, the Bible studies with the kids and working in the truth programs and stuff. And he got mad and he told her, says, well, if, she said, but I love the Lord. He says, well, if you love the Lord, he says, I thought you were in love with me. You just bring him down here and I'll take care of it. <laughs> this man became one powerful preacher one day. And he said, I asked God, I said, God, if you're so tough, then you come on. He said, and God whipped me from one end of this place to another, and I humbled myself before the things of the Lord. He said what he found was that she was so obedient to the Lord, and finally in her prayers, they began to, to move, and I come to know the Lord as my personal Savior. And she said, and when he come to know the Lord as his personal Savior, he began to run like I had never ran before. It tells us that it does happen, but that's never the plan of God. That's never what he desires for us to do. He wants us to, to believers to be with believers. But you can have hope to know that if you're faithful, the word of God says, woman, you will, you will win him by the way you live. 
your testimony before God. And that's what Betty did with Wayne. She won him uh, with her testimony, her, her desire to run after the things of the Lord. So then it goes on to say that, that we dwell, uh, I will dwell in them and they will walk among them. And it says, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. When we have a right relationship, that's what God desires to be for us. He said, therefore come out from among them and be separated, says the Lord. Do not touch which is unclean. I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. That word went out at that time, but still a word that is mighty yet today. It's a word that lets us know that you will have a lot of hardship when you marry them that are not in the, the body of Christ. When they don't desire the things of the Lord, there's a pulling, there's a, a separation in those things. But it also lets us know that if you're in that situation, then you need to what? Let the light shine. You need to let God glorify himself within you. You need to stand on the things of the Lord. It's one thing to... And, uh, to be busy, and I've had to share this with wives that were married to unbelievers. I said, you know, your first responsibility, yes, don't get so busy in the church that you can't take care of your home. Your first responsibility is your home. Because if you say you love the Lord, you're not taking care of your husband, not taking care of your children. I'm not saying that they're not being fed and clothes aren't clean. I'm just talking about that. Everything you're doing, I got to be at church, I got to be at church. No, your first responsibility is home. And this is how it is for me. My first responsibility is Anita. Our children are raised, but it was my family. It was those that are close to me. Uh, somewhere along the line, the church comes in there. But the church just can never be number one because I have a wife. Uh, and so she has to become before that. And when she wasn't before that, uh, it created problems in our home. And so it's letting us know that God has an order of things. And so there's some positive and there's some negative when we come separated from the things of, uh, of this world that God is calling us to, to operate and live in a way that we would see the glory of him operating in the lives of others. And so it doesn't matter that where they're at, God is able to win. And we'll be faithful to be faithful to him as we live life be for them. Then this note here that says, to be separate, separated means to be sanctified, set apart for salvation and service. The word of God has the power to separate the believer uh, from sin. In John 17, it says this, and it's the prayer of Jesus. Now, we know that we say, our Father who art in heaven, but that's not his prayer. His prayer is John 17. Verse 9, it says, I pray for them. I, and Jesus is saying this. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me. He's talking to God the Father. For they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine. He's letting us know down that God and he are one. He says, and I am glorified in them. Now, I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I I. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name, kept through your name, uh, those who you have given me. So he says, I continue to preach and share you before them that you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. It lets us know that Jesus and the Father are one, Jesus, Father, and Holy Spirit are one, and that we are one in them and and that uh, they are one in us, that we can have that relationship. And that's what he's saying here, that we as children of God, we can have a oneness that is in Christ Jesus. So he says that, that I kept them the, uh, through your name, those who you have given me, that they may be one as we are. And while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. He says, I live that life, and that's what he's saying to us, with our sons and daughters, the people we work with, that we stay before and stay about the things of the Lord, that people might be encouraged, and, and those that, but also in the body of Christ, with one another, that we will be faithful to the things of the Lord towards one another. He says that, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So the word of God tells us that now that we're a new creation, the old things have passed away. We're not of this world. We live in it, but we're not of it. We're of another kingdom. That's why Paul says, I'm an ambassador of what the kingdom of God. We are ambassadors of God's kingdom. So we're not of this world, uh, but we are of his world. 
I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that they should keep them, that you would keep them from the evil one. And so then again we said that wouldn't it be God's plan that once we got saved that he would take us out of this wicked world and that we would be with him instead of leaving us here. But he said, I did not take them out of the world, but that I just ask that you would guard them, keep them from the wickedness of this world, from the devil, from, from all of the temptations that are there, that you would keep them. So I do not take them from the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth and what your word is truth. And that's the part that we need to know. God's word is what it is truth for us day in and day out. And as you sent me into the world, I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I have sanctified myself that they also may be sanctified by truth. So again, Jesus said he separated himself that they may be sanctified separated. Now what did he do? He separated himself from himself for he is God. And he put on sinfulness of man. He became a man to walk on this earth to die for our sin. He says what? He says that as you sent me into the world I also I, and for their sake I sanctified I set myself apart that they also may be sanctified by the truth. And the truth is what? Jesus said, I'm the life, I'm the, I'm the truth, the life, and the way. And no one comes to the Father except by me. And then we see in the other part of Scripture, well, we, we'll finish that up and start up the, the next one um, uh, next week. And then we'll be gone for two weeks. And then, uh, and then we'll be back. And what do you want to do next week? Do we want to meet or what do you want to do? I mean, I don't have a problem. We can finish up this, but I don't want to really start another one and then leave. Well, we'll find out what the children are doing and it'll be now Sunday. Okay, that's what we'll do. All right. Did everyone have a chance to say, uh, sign the prayer sheet tonight? Let's pray one for another, believe in God. Let's pray. Father, we come before you tonight, Lord, and we thank you for who you are. And you have set us apart, Lord, to do the work of the kingdom. You have called us by name, Lord, and you said that we are your sheep, and your sheep know you, and you know us. Lord, I pray that our relationship with you, Lord, will be in such a way that we will know your heart, Lord, and the desires of your heart, and that the desires of your heart will become our desires, that we would run and live for you, that we would run and live in such a way that would bring you glory and bring you honor. And Lord, and I thank you tonight, Lord, that we're not of this world we live here, but we're not of it. We're of the kingdom of God. And let us stay focused, Lord, on what we're really about. For Lord, our hope is not in this world, but our hope, Lord, is within you. We pray tonight, Lord, for our sons and daughters, Lord. Some, Lord, have been prodigals, Lord, and they've, they've walked away, Lord, but we know that the prodigal came back. And so, Lord, let us continue to pray and believe and share this hope, Lord, every opportunity and love. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, that you will begin to bring to your remembrance, Lord, that word that was spoken to them that caused their heart at one time to be glad, that their hearts would be reunited, Lord, that with you. And so, Lord, tonight we have found hope in your word. We're believing, Lord, that the seed that has been planted will bring forth much fruit. We're believing, Lord, that in this day, Lord, where it tells us how dark this world is, that, Lord, the fruit of your love, Lord, will be manifested before all, and they will see that the light overcomes the darkness. And so we give you praise for that as well. Lord, I pray tonight, Lord, that you'll touch the lives of those that we put on the concern list tonight. Touch them in a mighty way, Lord. Lord, we believe in the power of healing and deliverance, Lord. We believe, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, that these things, Lord, are not too hard for you, that you're able, Lord, to do exceedingly above all that we have asked or hoped. And, Lord, so we bring them before you now, Lord, that your glory may be revealed. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.